America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver, 97.3 FM in Eugene, Oregon. And once again, as we do from time to time, we've brought the cameras in here uh, for this particular segment of the radio program because I have something that I want to uh, that I want to talk to a lot of different people about. Something that's been out there in the news a lot recently. You know, since the uh, tragedy in Orlando recently at the nightclub there, at the, the uh, terrorist act there at the shooting, uh, there's been all kinds of folks come out that have not uh, focused on the Muslim terrorist aspect of this, but instead have focused on guns as the issue, particularly assault rifles, assault weapons. And one of the things I'm hearing from a lot of these liberals and anti-gunners and, and just other people who may not be that familiar with the issue as well, one of the things I hear a lot from them is, well, why would you need an AR-15 to defend yourself anyway? Or why would you need an assault rifle to protect yourself? Now, I'm not going to go into all of the uh, definitions and all that of what is an assault rifle and what isn't. And was the, the gun there in Orlando actually an AR-15? No, it wasn't. But, but I'm not going to go into all of that because plenty of other people out there on, on the internet and on the media have done all of that. All of that's out there. Instead, what I want to do is tackle this uh, from a more everyday person perspective. Because I know that there are a lot of people that are using the question of, why do you need an AR-15 to defend yourself? as kind of a pejorative thing, as though they think they'll win an argument by saying that. But... Even though a lot of people are doing that, and a good majority of those people probably have no real interest in why we would use a weapon like that in that circumstance, I know that there have to be at least a few within that group uh, who do have a genuine curiosity. Maybe they're anti-gun folks, but at the same time, they also legitimately wonder why it is that some of us justify the use uh, of an AR-15 or a purchase of an AR-15 or an AK-47 or some other... Uh, weapon like that for home defense. They, by by their limited understanding of those weapons, they don't seem to them like like those weapons would be practical for a home defense or a self defense situation. So, to those people, I'm directing this segment. Those who, even if you're anti gun, if you've got a uh, genuine curiosity about why some of us select these weapons for home or self defense, uh, I'm talking to you. I at least want to answer some of those questions for you. And then uh, you guys can make up your own minds from there, but at least you'll have a little bit more information and insight into the thought process of some of us Americans who enjoy the AR platform or the AK platform or the so-called assault rifle, I hate that term, uh, in terms of a self-defense situation, okay? So let's start with this point. I'm going to give you a visual here for those on YouTube. Those on the radio who are listening to me right now, you'll need to... Uh, You'll need to use your imaginations a little bit, so bear with me. But uh, this right here is my AR-15. Now, it's nothing fancy. It's nothing spectacular. Uh, I'm sure any of you can go to any number of other places on YouTube right now and find far fancier and far more intricate AR-15s than mine. But this is mine. I trust my life to it, and it's uh, one of the best investments I've ever made as, as far as I'm concerned in terms of, of my home defense setup. Now... Why did I make this selection? Let's, let's, start, let's start with this point. And a lot of you who really don't have a lot of uh, interaction with guns may be surprised at what I'm about to say. Uh, no matter how accurate you are with a handgun, even if you're a world-class marksman with a handgun, you will still be more accurate with a rifle than you will with any handgun. Okay? The reason for that is rather simple, because with a handgun, you only have two points of contact at most with it. You know, you have uh, both hands on the handgun, or maybe one. You only have one point of contact in some cases. But at the most, you've got two if you have two, two hands on the gun. But on a rifle, you have uh, up to four points of contact. And don't worry, there's nobody back there at the camera. It's on a tripod, so I'm not sweeping anybody here. But I'm illustrating this to show you, to, to show you here. If I have my uh, my rifle up here, I've got four different points with it here. I've got my left hand right here, my right hand on the uh, uh, you know on on the uh, uh, trigger here. Eventually, if I were to do that, I've got my shoulder on the buttstock here, and then my cheek here. So these four points of contact are going to make it much easier for me to control that rifle and to be accurate with it. Now, the demonstration of this is whenever I go to the local gun range. I might take uh, one of my handguns, like uh, this one right here, and this is one of my carry guns right here. I might take this particular gun and shoot it at a seven yard target. And uh, 
you know, I'll do that. I'll be fairly accurate with it. But then if I take this AR-15 right here and uh, shoot that at a 25-yard target at the same range, I'm going to be far more accurate with this rifle. Okay, So accuracy is a big difference there with the rifle as opposed to the handgun. And that's no small thing. Yes, I know that makes a lot of sense in terms of, you know, of stopping the threat if you're in a, in a threatening situation, but it's, it's more than that. Because if you're accurate with a handgun or a rifle, not only are you going to be more likely to hit your target and stop your threat, but you're also less likely to miss shots that will then potentially exit your home and go into the next door neighbor's home or someone else's yard or hit an innocent bystander. And that's critical. What a lot of people don't realize is, is that for a lot of those of us in the so-called gun community, if you will, when we are putting together our plan for our home defense setup, our home defense scenario, one of the major things we consider, one of the major things we look at is how to minimize the possibility for an innocent party to be impacted. We want to hit the threat. We don't want to hit anybody else. Well, if I've got a rifle that I'm far more accurate with than I am a handgun, and if I can get to that rifle and use that in that situation, now I've minimized even more the possibility for errantly hitting an innocent bystander. I want to stop the threat, but I don't want to stop anybody else. So that's the key number one point for my selection of an AR-15 as my primary home defense weapon over a very good handgun, which I might carry or I might also have as a secondary, uh, a secondary possibility in my home defense setup. Okay, so we've established that a rifle is more accurate than a handgun because you have more control of it, more points of contact on it. Some of you are probably still asking, well, okay, a rifle is more, uh, a rifle is more accurate than a handgun, but why do you need an AR-15? Can't you just use a traditional hunting rifle or something like that? Well, certainly you could, and a lot of people do that, and that's, that's well and good. But the AR-15 or the AK-47, uh, offers you some additional advantages that you might not have with the traditional hunting rifle. Now, one of the advantages is that for as big and scary as this gun looks and is as evil as it looks in a Hollywood movie, uh, it's actually a gun that's very easy to manipulate, very easy to operate, has very little recoil. It's very light. It's lighter than a lot of other rifles out there. So not only is that more convenient for me, who has some degree of experience with guns, but it's also something that translates to being a good weapon for, let's say, a, you know, a petite woman who might not have as much uh, experience with guns. Or if a, a teenager is called into, uh, called into a situation where they have to defend a home. Or it's good for maybe an older person who has some physical challenges, somebody in a wheelchair, someone who's had a stroke in the past, someone who does not have the full range of motion that uh, that some of us are still blessed with right now. Maybe they've had issues in their life and that's happened. So this becomes a very good weapon for them because it is light. It has very little recoil. You know, I, I heard the, the story some New York writer put in uh, to a newspaper about he fired an AR-15 and it, it gave him a post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm like, are you kidding? If an AR-15 bruised your shoulder that way or if the noise or the, the recoil was that bad, I have to, I have to ask... Uh, do you wet your pants during the average 4th of July celebration? Because it's about on that level. So if there is a someone who has a less amount of experience with guns or someone who's petite of frame, light of frame, or does not have a great deal of physical strength, I would much prefer that they have something like an AR-15 than a traditional hunting rifle because the chances are they're going to be much more likely to be able to uh, manipulate and operate this weapon uh, with, in, in an unencumbered way and will be more successful with it in terms of stopping the threat. So that is a great advantage for it. It's a very easy gun to use. It's very light in terms of recoil. And it, uh, as scary as it might look, it's actually not that scary to use. And it's actually not that intimidating to use. I, I have seen so many cases. In fact, I saw one today when I was down at the local range of someone shooting an AR-15 for the first time and, and you kind of see it in their face, you kind of see it in their eyes if they're anticipating just this big cannon shot and then they're pleasantly surprised when it doesn't happen. And they're pleasantly surprised when they see how easy it is to maneuver and, 
and and how pleasant it is to shoot and so that's one of the great advantages to the AR-15. A second advantage is the modularity of it. In other words, the, the way you can customize them. And I'm not talking about customization in terms of a vanity project, although clearly some people do that with their ARs and their AKs. That's all well and good. But there's a lot of functional things you can do with an AR-15 or an AK-47 that will help you in your home defense setup. For example, you'll see that I have a... Uh, light on my uh, AR-15. Now, that's not just something fancy to have it there. If it's the middle of the night and there's a you know bump in the night, as it were, someone's in my home, that light is going to be able to give me an opportunity to positively identify the threat and make sure that I'm not errantly shooting someone that I don't need to be shooting. I can positively identify my threat and know exactly what I'm doing at a given time. That's one more advantage that I have. And it's right there mounted on the gun. Mounted on the rifle. I don't have to awkwardly, you know, awkwardly try to use a rifle or a handgun and have a, a light in either hand. You can train to do that, and that's great. But all of this is right here. Likewise, I have, and this is something I've chosen to do, I have a forward grip on this particular gun. Some people don't like those. I particularly do like it. That's an item that, that makes me a little bit more steady in handling the gun and, and shooting it. So there again, we get back into the accuracy factor. I'm trying to do everything I can as a homeowner, as a responsible citizen, I'm trying to do everything I can to reduce the possibility for a missed shot landing somewhere it shouldn't or impacting someone's life in a way that it shouldn't. That's a very critical thing. I feel like the AR-15 gives me more advantages in that respect, in terms of that accuracy, in terms of keeping harm out of the way of my neighbors and others than another rifle would. And then finally, there's one more advantage that I find with the AR-15. And some of you, uh, some of you are going to look at this as a detriment, but I look at it, at it as an advantage. And I'm talking about capacity. There's many different magazine uh, possibilities out there for the AR-15. One of the more common, probably the most common, is the 30-round magazine. That's what I've got right here. There's 30 rounds in this magazine. Now, critics would say, well, that's that, that makes it so easy for a serial killer to go into a nightclub and just shoot, 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 shoot. Well, I suppose that on a basic level that might be true, but you see, that advantage does not only go the way of the bad guy. That advantage also goes the way of the person, the good person, trying to defend themselves or their family. Consider this. Let's say that there is a home invasion. And there are multiple people involved with the home invasion. It's not just some random criminal. He's got two or three dudes with him. They may all have firearms. Now, certainly, the homeowner in that case is in a disadvantage no matter what. No doubt about it. You are at a disadvantage from the word go. But you, would you rather face that situation with a six-shot revolver or with an AR-15 with a 30-round capacity? Or maybe a 100-round drum. Those exist you'd at least stand a fighting chance. You'd at least stand the puncher's chance, as it were. You know, uh, those of you who listen to me on the radio, you, you've heard me refer to a few times the fact that we tape this show and that we live just a few miles down the road from Ferguson, Missouri. We're not in the middle of it. You know, we, didn't, we weren't in the middle of all the riots and everything that happened, but we were close enough that uh, there was an impact on our lives. And one of the things I remember seeing in Ferguson was uh, you know, these roving bands of gangs, roving bands of criminals going around and, and, and you know, shooting up people and light, lighting buildings on fire and throwing Molotov cocktails at cops and everything else. That was a real thing. And I know that when I initially bring up the idea of, hey, what about a home invasion where there's multiple people involved, some of you out there are probably thinking, oh, that's far-fetched, it would rarely happen, you don't have to worry about it. It's kind of a crap-hits-the-fan scenario, right? Well... I'm here to tell you, living just a few miles from Ferguson, we've seen real, genuine, crap-hit-the-fan scenarios happen. Now, thankfully, they don't happen every day, but you never know, never know when they're going to happen and where and why. And I sure would like to have something with me that gives me every possible advantage I can have. The bad guy is always going to have an advantage, but I'm looking in my home defense setup to, to figure out how I can minimize as many of those advantages that the bad guy may possibly have. So in short, there's a number of reasons that an AR-15 is a perfectly good option for home defense or self-defense. 
you have the lightness and ease of use, you have the modularity, you have the rifle that can be used by all members of the family, you know, you have this uh, adjustable buttstock here that if you're a really tall person, you can, you can move it all the way out. If you're a short person, a uh, small wife, you can move it in, and, and everybody in the family can use that rifle. You don't have to figure out which rifle do I use. You can add all kinds of equipment on there that are going to help you be more accurate, and you have a capacity that can help you deal with any situation that may come about. Now, I know there are other people out there that would prefer to use other weapons for home defense. I have no problem with that. Maybe you live in an apartment. Maybe you live in, uh, maybe your situation is a little bit different, and some other weapon might be better for you. That's well and good. But to a lot of folks, we look at the AR-15 or the AK-47 with all of its advantages, and we say, yeah, that's a good idea for my home defense setup. Now, in closing, let me mention this. We've heard a lot of talk over these last uh, few days about banning the sale of AR-15s to civilians. Well, let me be clear. The fact that I own this weapon does not put you in any more danger. If I were prohibited from owning this weapon, or heaven forbid if some government tried to take it away from me, you would not be any more safe. I certainly would not be any more safe, but I know you would not be any more safe. Because as long as I own this weapon, this weapon will not end up being uh, uh, taken into a nightclub and shooting up gay people. This weapon will not be used in a Ferguson situation. This weapon will not be used by another uh, Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris. But what we've seen is that no matter what laws are out there, weapons like this and, and other weapons will be used by those terrorists wherever they are. Charlie Hebdo in France. Those criminals, those terrorists, used weapons that were illegal in France. Germany, same thing. We've seen countless examples of this throughout Europe and Africa, of guns that were banned being used by terrorists. So if you take this rifle away from me, you don't impact them at all. All you do is impact me and impact you. So in closing, I would say this. You may not like the AR-15 as a home defense weapon, and you may choose not to use it yourself. That's within your prerogative. After all, it is a right to bear arms. It's not an obligation, and I respect that. But do not interfere with me or other Americans being able to choose the best tools that we feel are available for our own home defense situation. That is all that any of us ask. You know, as I uh, heard the different reactions that people had to uh, the tragedy in Orlando over the last week, and, and people dealing with this in their own way, and of course that's going to be different for everybody. We're all unique in that regard, but as I heard people deal with this um, and talk about it and talk amongst each other and talk out in public and just kind of talk through their feelings, I was struck by a couple things I'm hearing people say a lot that on one hand I can understand why they say these things, but on the other hand I, I think it's a little dangerous to get caught up in um, some of what they're saying in these ideas. You know, people, people are obviously so horrified at what they see, and understandably so. We all are horrified. We all are shocked. And to a moral righteous person, to a normal human being, it, it, it's very difficult to comprehend the violence and, and the events that happen in an Orlando or a San Bernardino or, or any of these other terrorist attacks that we talk about. You and I can't comprehend it because you and I were brought up the right way. We don't have that in us to do something like that to innocent people. And so I guess in dealing with that sometimes, I've heard a lot of people over the last week talk about, well, you know, this is a horrible tragedy, but love will win in the end. Or we, we, we defeat this not by, not by violence and not by hate, but we defeat this, we defeat these radical terrorists 
by showing them a better way, by being better people. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, I know that that's a very attractive idea. I know it's something that might even make us feel a little bit better in the face of such tragedy. And in that sense, perhaps there's some value to it. But I would caution you. I would caution you that when some of the sadness wears off, it never completely will, of course, but when we get back to brass tacks, when we get back to reality, we need to realize that love is not going to resolve this, at least not love of that culture, love of those people. It will not resolve this. We must realize that simply trying to understand them and put a hand out to them will not resolve this issue. I know in a perfect world it would, but, but we don't live in a perfect world. you got to get back to reality, folks. There's a popular phrase, uh, particularly in the gay community and when it comes to like the, the gay marriage stuff, and I've, I've heard this phrase, I've seen this phrase being used since Orlando, the phrase, love wins. Again, it sounds nice. We all would like that to be true, but if you look at world history, if you look at the history of humankind, you see that no, it usually doesn't. Instead, what you see, if you're honest about it, is it's just the opposite is true. I want you to think back. When the United States defeated Germany and Italy and Japan in World War II, did we defeat them and bring them to their knees and, and knock them out of power? Did we do that by loving them? No. We hated Germany and Italy and Japan in World War II, and with very good reason. And that hate motivated us to sacrifice and do what was necessary in order to win that war for humankind. I suppose you could say it was a love for our families, a love for our country, a love for humankind, a love for Western civilization, that I will buy. But it was not a love for the Germans and the Japanese. It was a hatred of them. For us to love humanity, we had to hate the Japanese. We had to hate the Germans. And that hate motivated us to use bombs and guns and sacrifice our own lives to bring them to justice and bring them to justice we did. It was not love that knocked Adolf Hitler out of power. It was guns and bombs that knocked Adolf Hitler out of power. Never forget that. It was not love that put the Japanese in their place at the end of World War II. It was two atomic bombs that put the Japanese in their place at the end of World War II. Two atomic bombs because after the first one, they still wouldn't surrender. We had to do it again. Now, I don't mean to jump down the throats of any of you who are... Um, dare I say it, medicating this emotional pain by talking about love. I understand why you're doing it. Again, it's, a, it's an attractive notion. And maybe it helps us cope on some level, I don't know. But at some point, we got to get down to brass tacks and actually deal with the issues. At some point, we got to get down to brass tacks and actually deal with the real problems. we got to get back to reality. we got to realize that throughout world history far more has been accomplished in the name of hate than in the name of love. Now, not all of it has been positive, but a good degree of it has been. We hated the British at one time. And what we do? We rebelled and started our own nation. If it weren't for that hate, we wouldn't be here in America today. If it weren't for hate, we wouldn't have won World War II. If it weren't for hate, I dare to, I shudder to think what Europe would be like today, what Japan would be like today. Now again, you can argue that it's love for ourselves, love for our families, maybe even love for humanity, I get it. 
But you cannot have that same love for those people who would destroy us. You can't love them to civilization. You cannot love them to peace. Peace is actually a very fleeting thing in human history if you really look at it. Humankind's most natural state is war. But war is not always a bad thing. War can be a tool used for good, just as it can also be a tool used for evil. Well, given what we've seen in Orlando and on countless other occasions before that, we must commit ourselves to using the tools of violence and war, and yes, hate. Because if we fall short of that, we have no chance against the Muslims and the terrorists. We don't. This isn't some theoretical college course where it's important to win the right way. Folks, if we try to fight the right way, we're going to lose and we're going to die. That's really what this is about. Hate wins. Thanks for joining us once again. This is American's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week. Goodbye, everybody.